Hi, so um, I'm going to be reading from my new book, which is called The Venera Dreams of Weird Entertainment. Uh, what it is, is a mosaic of 15 episodes, all centered on a fictional city-state called Venera, off the coast of Italy. And uh, the book is divided into um, three sections of four episodes each, with an extra three interstitial episodes. And I'm going, to be, I'm going to be reading from across the span of, of the book, six brief excerpts, to give you an idea of the scope and the tones that uh, make up the whole book. So we're, we're, going to be, we're going to begin with the overture, which is an episode called Bedtime Stories. And so the cycle goes. Scheherazade slips unnoticed in and out of this prison. She sings him stories that lull him to sleep and to dream his own endings. He wakes and writes stories of Venera. He drinks more wine and dreams more of Venera. The carafe of wine is never empty. The pen never dries. Occasionally, his body urges him to reach out so as to taste and savor Scheherazade herself. She will not deny him. Her gaze and her touch make that angry clear. But the bereavement he feels over his isolation from Isabel never dissipates, and so he leaves his lust unquenched. Dozens of nights and days pass, hundreds, perhaps a thousand, perhaps more, until one day, Pierre has filled every page of the notebook. He waits a long time, but Scheherazade never returns. Finally, he again takes to knocking on the door and calling out to Scheherazade. He tries to open the door, to find it unlocked. Quickly, he dresses, grabbing the storybook he leaves. So the first a uh, big, uh, big section of the book is called Strange Romances. And I'm going to read from the first of four grotesque love stories uh, that make up that section. Uh, and that story was also the very first story of Venera that was ever published in 2010. And of all things, cheesing online. So we're coming back to the full circle here. So here's an excerpt from The City of Unrequited Dreams. I booked passage on a boat that was to circle around the south of Greece, and then eventually travel across the sea all the way to Barcelona. But I had no intention of reaching Spain. A little more than two full days after we left Greece, as the sun set among the clouds gathering from the west, I finally caught sight of Venera far in the distance. Save for the light from the city-state, once the sun was completely swallowed up, darkness enveloped us like a cloak. The first hints of rain brought with them a chill that cut me to the bone. Rain was good. It hit tears so well. From my jacket's inside pocket, I drew the last of my vermilion snuff. Up my nose it went. The euphoria was instantaneous. So why would I climb even harder? The rain had driven the other passengers inside. I was alone on the deck. I climbed over the rail and without hesitation jumped into the Mediterranean. I was so deeply under the spell of vermilion that I didn't even notice the impact. But completely submerged, I choked on the cold, briny seawater. I'd never been a good swimmer. This would be over quickly. Nevertheless, I was booing back to the surface. In the distance, I glimpsed the lights from Venera, the lights of unrequited dreams. I let myself sink deeper and deeper. The underbelly of the great Venera revealed itself, glowing with colors I could never have imagined. Shimmery, pulsing, undulating, as if it were alive and in constant metamorphosis, 
a glorious farewell hallucination, courtesy of the vermilion tingling throat me? Or was I being allowed to perceive an aspect of the true, perhaps unfathomable nature of this strange metropolis? My lungs clamored for air. I almost opened my mouth and swallowed. Almost let the water fill my lungs. Ignoring the pull of both life and death, I closed my eyes, and the afterimage of an era lingered. Its intensity growing instead of fading. Again, I surfaced, gasping and shivering. Once my breathing settled back to normal, my gaze locked on the distant Venera. I possessed neither the strength nor the skill to undertake such a long swim. But the city-state's tendrils had by now snaked deeply within me, and I could not ignore the eerie beckoning. So next up, there's an interlude called Vermilion Dreams, the complete works of Grand Jameson. And here's a, a brief excerpt. In the framing sequence of the Scheherazade mosaic, Brian Jameson is a literature scholar researching the links between the Arabian Nights and the secret history of Venera. He descends into the buried ruins of the city-state and finds himself in a strange underworld of vermilion lights where he encounters the seemingly immortal Scheherazade, who bears a small cask of vermilion wine. The two share the wine and together enter the metafictional world of story. The second important section is called Adventures in Times Past, and it's comprised of four adventure stories set in four different epics in Venera's past. I'm going to read from the final one of these, uh, set in 1982, and it's called The Surrealist Lanterns. As the sun rises, the vermilion red waters recede. Venera is revealed. Reborn, as strange and beautiful as it should be. The whole city glistens in the sunlight, still damp from its watery rebirth. At first, the, the resuscitated Venerans wander the vias in a dazed stumble. But then, some of them catch sight of Dali atop his space elephant. A crowd gathers and grows by the water. The Venerans whisper and chatter among each other. The voices are too dim and too far away for Dali to decipher what is being said. Besides, Dali has always struggled to make sense of the Venerian dialect. Then one voice booms over the rest. Dali! Dali has saved Venera! It is his friend, Tito Braun, wielding a handheld camera, filming the surrealist and his space elephant. The crowd takes up the chant. Dali! 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 The age of surrealist soaks up the adulation, almost forgetting the pain of his bones, almost forgetting how profoundly exhausted he is, almost forgetting the grief of having so recently lost his beloved gal. If only he could revive her as he has revived Venera. But no, Gala was mortal, whereas Venera and all men who inhabit her exist beyond the mundane world. His thoughts are interrupted by the lanterns. All five of them rise from their casings, blinking and ringing in alarm. Other surrealist lanterns are active in close proximity. Salvador Dali's five, five levitating lanterns form an X with the dodecahedron in the center. A beam of surreal light issues from the dodecahedron locating the source of the other lantern activity. The five neo-fascists stand in a circle on a venerian rooftop, each of them wielding a different surrealist lantern. A dark roar of energy builds around the quintet. There's no time to lose. The city is again in deadly danger. Salvador Dali grabs a dodecahedron and dons it as a helmet. It's stand reverse, pointed antenna-like, on top of the artist's head. The other four lanterns congregate and attach themselves to the makeshift helmet. Dali becomes imbued with the faculties of all five of the lanterns, as filtered for the most powerful of them all, the lantern of creation, the Dodecahedron. 
valley is transformed into the surrealist lantern, courageous and relentless protector of madness, beauty, and art. The surrealist lantern speeds through the sky toward the neo-fascist usurpers of the lantern's powers. On the ground, Tito Braun shouts, lights! The surrealist lantern glows with the power and intensity of Dali's imagination. Camera! Bronze points his camera toward the rooftop where the neo-fascists are assembled as the surrealist lantern confronts them. Action! And the fight is on! With the fight of Venera in the balance, the fate of madness and art and beauty, the stakes for which Dali has always fought and will always fight with his dying breath. Next up is another interlude, this one called the Phantasmagorical Odyssey of Shakerazza. And here's a brief excerpt. Three Phantasmagorical Odysseys of Scheherazade is an anthology of novellas by some of the most notorious writers of the Venera art scene. Each story bears the same title, a Phantasmagorical Odyssey of Scheherazade. In a rare new text since its self-imposed exile to Venera, Magus Amore uh, writes a surreal parade of erotic perversions, body modifications, Exquisite torture and disquieting rituals. Entirely devoid of plot, the novella follows Scheherazade's escapades through a relentless orgy of shock, sex, and horror. Grand Jameson probes the inner world of Scheherazade's imagination. Using the language, tropes, and conventions of psychotherapy, he recounts the adventure of the archetypal storyteller trapped in her own mind as she navigates the labyrinth of story that makes up her identity. In the lyrical and poignant version of the story by Renata Austin, two-time recipient of the Venera Fantasy Award, Scheherazade wanders an infinite road, encountering the characters and settings of her own tales. One by one, she sheds and forgets these fabulations, until all that is left of her is a young Ethiopian girl in the world before civilization, before We're going to end with a short uh, excerpt from a story called Vermilion Wine. And that's the last story in the book. It's also the last episode in the third section, which is called The Secret Histories of Magus Amor. She woke up in darkness. She glanced at the open bottle of Vino Vermilio by her bedside and took another intoxicating sip. Soft, muted sounds wafted in through her open window. The murmur of conversations, the slow, click, the slow clicking clack of heels on cobblestone, the subtle vibrations of live acoustic music, the almost imperceptible damp resonances of the sea. Still shone the stolen, stolen vermilion shoes, still holding the bottle of Vino Vermilio. She followed the siren call of the nightlight. Out, Monica went. Around her, the people walked unhurriedly, talked in calm tones, leaned into each other with complicit intimacy. Almost every voice spoke a language she could not quite identify. It had the musicality of Italian. But the words were suddenly different, and sometimes utterly alien. The shoes seemed to guide her. She followed them to wherever they might be. her. The city she wandered through, she could not recognize as Venice. Already, the architecture of Venice was otherworldly, unlike that of anywhere else on the planet. But what Monica now beheld was exponentially strange. The buildings had a cocky biological feel to them, the shapes obeying a geometry that defied her comprehension. The cityscape was so alive that it appeared to change and shift that she stared at it, the perpetually changing mosaic work of art. The clothing of the people around her, although modern, followed fashions unfamiliar to her, were often more scale revealing than any city she knew would normally allow. Sometimes, out of the corner of her eye, she thought she spied denizens who might not be quite human. The very air around her shimmered with the potentiality of the impossible. 
The word drifted to her ears from the conversation that whisked by Venera. She waved the heft of the bottle in her hands. Once more, Monica drank from the vino vermilio, the vermilion potion that had somehow transported her here to this imaginary city dreamt up. She knew now, beyond a doubt, as more the potent beverage seemed into her, not by Magus Amore, not by any person. Venera was the city of Venice's dreams, unfettered by the constraints of mundane reality, petty mores, or dreary human concerns. A phantasmagorical city-state dreamt up by an overcommodified city yearning for weird intrigue and grotesque romance, yearning to seduce and fulfill the fantasies of those with enough imagination to perceive the dark, ineffable mysteries that inspire its innermost thought. Monica drank again from the vermilion wine. She drank deeply, then continued to wander the impossible streets of Venera. Thank you.